Hello and welcome. Today I am joined by Gary Lewin, who I've actually just found out his new job title is Head of Sports Medicine and Sports Science at Arsenal Women. So, Gary, welcome and thanks for joining. Thanks, Andy. Yeah, nice, nice to be with you. So, yeah, we'll come back into your, your new role, which is it sounds really exciting in, in, a, in a sec. But, I mean, again, you'll be a very familiar face for, for me, having grown up watching the, the England games and uh, over the years. But I, I just wanted to go back to kind of the start and find out a bit more about you and how you got involved in this area. Um, so, whereabouts are you from originally? I was actually born in East Ham in London, um, and I was always going to be a footballer. And... Uh, at 14, I signed at Arsenal. In those days, you signed as a schoolboy. And uh, I signed apprenticeship when I was 16. Um, first year pro when I was 17, but then unfortunately got released when I was 18. And uh, at the time, I didn't know what I wanted to do. Um, and th there was a physio at Arsenal then called Fred Street, and uh, who I still to talk to today. And he, at the time, ironically, was the England and Arsenal physio. And uh, he said to me, would you fancy going into physiotherapy? So he arranged for me to go to Guy's Hospital where he knew the principal. I had a look around and I got quite interested in it. And um, I had to go back and get my A-level. So I went back to my old junior school or secondary school, should I say, and did my A-levels in a year. I scraped through them somehow in a year and then got accepted at Guy's Hospital in the summer of uh, 1983. Um, that year I played for Barnet when I first left Arsenal. So I was playing with Barry Fry at Barnet, which is an experience and probably a podcast on its own. And um, yeah, 83 to 86, I trained at Guy's. My plan was to carry on playing football. But ironically, Arsenal come back to me and said, well, I fancy working with the academy, um, well, the youth team as it was then, and the reserve team as the physio. And uh, so I, I did that at Arsenal whilst I was training as a chartered physio. So I was getting the best of both worlds. I was getting formal training, and I was getting hands-on experience and then qualified in 86, um, did a few months on the wards at Guy's, on the cardiac wards at Guy's Hospital and then was offered the first team job at Arsenal in September 1986 when I was 22 by George Graham. And as they say, the rest is history then. I had two, 22 great years first time around and uh, obviously found myself back here now. <laughs> yeah, there's a lot to go through there. You've yeah. covered a lot of in good information there. So. In terms of that, that getting into the physio, was that as soon as you started looking into it, did you straight away think, yes, this is something that I think you can get my teeth into? Not really. I, I, wanted, to, I wanted to be a PE teacher and uh, or even a policeman. And uh, <clears throat> But then I met some people that trained as physios and then I was looking around because I was still playing at Arsenal when I first was uh, thinking about it. And then I, I suddenly got interested. I had a couple of injuries myself, and I thought, actually, this is there's something in this. I quite enjoy this. And then, um, so I sort of it sort of crept up on me. And then when the opportunity arose, I thought, yeah, th this is what I'm going to do. I mean, obviously, in today's game, it would never happen. Um, but in the 80s, when I started, there weren't chartered physios in football. I think there was only two or three in the league. They were all FA diploma or um, what we call sponge men, which were ex-players that did a first aid course. So um, it was a very strange environment where you were really led by the doctors and, and you were an old fashioned sponge man. Right. Now, it's interesting you mentioned that, actually, because uh, I spoke to Phil Pasquier on this morning, actually, yeah. and he was, he was talking about P, uh, like P teaching and he said how valuable it was for him when he was building up that, yeah. that kind of the, the, the amateur to professional side of rugby. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I've known Phil quite a long time, so yeah, he's uh, he's been in it probably a bit longer than me. I think I'm going to be disrespectful to him, um, but yeah, for me, one of the biggest attributes I had when I started was the fact that being a footballer and coming through the ranks at Arsenal, I understood what it was like. I understood what they were feeling, what the process was. I understood the game. If I was rehabbing someone back to to fitness, I understood what their demands were, what their needs were. So it really helped me early on. Um, so, yeah, I, I would totally agree. Mm. And then, so you go into Arsenal, you're still a really young guy going in there. Like you say, so were you, but also one of the more qualified people in the league then at that point as well? Yeah, I think there's only three chartered physios in the league. I remember Don Taylor at Southampton was one. Fred Street, who left Arsenal, was one. Um, 
I'm struggling to think of anyone else from that from that era. Uh, and, and then it started to happen. It started creeping in late 80s, early 90s. More chartered physios came in. Then um, regulations started coming out about how you had to have chartered physios working in the game. Um, at that time, the doctors were very much part time. But as it's evolved, they've become more full time in, in football clubs. Um, I was one physio working with the first team reserves and academy. So I was in charge of 70 players on my own for the first eight or nine years. Um, so I'll be honest, when you look back at it, you did a job, but you didn't do it properly. You, you were just papering over cracks and can they play, can't they play, what treatment do they need? And um, whereas now it's a massive industry with, with large staff, large more demands from the players, more demands from the sport more qualified people with a lot more expertise. Um, and when I talk to people, I'm not an academic, I'm a shop floor physio. I, I learnt my trade on the shop floor and that's, that's the way I regard it. Mm. So what was it like then when you go into this place? You've got iconic players at Arsenal, George Graham, you've got massive personalities. And like, what, what, do they like, do they take you seriously? What What's the response? <clears throat> yeah, I mean, again, I had a slight advantage because three years, four years before, a lot of them I was actually playing with. So um, they actually knew me, although I was a young kid at the time. They knew me uh, as a youth team player. I played a few reserve games. Um, but what you have to do, you have to impose your own personality on them because they are very dominant. They're, they're, they were stars. They were well-known footballers, international players. Um, but you just have to be um, confident in what you're doing, sure about what you're doing, but humble. Um, because in the day, I was a 22-year-old going into a a working environment so the doctors I worked with at the time were very very helpful Fred Street was really good to me and was a mentor for me all during those early years um, and you never stop learning you, you went I went to all the surgeries I went to all the specialist appointments and just kept learning it was like a constant CPD really you, every day you're learning something different and was that something that <clears throat> excuse me you were like really passionate about that you wanted to go and do that or is it because you were interested or because you just knew you had to anyone that knows me i'm i'm passionate about football i watch anything from going over the park to any games on telly it drives my wife mad but um i'm passionate about the game i'm passionate uh, about what i did at this club i was passionate about working with england and i was just really really lucky to have two long stints in both and uh, having some incredibly good years, which uh, experiences that um, obviously will go uh, stay with me forever. No, I can imagine. So th at that point, Arsenal then, so you had a really successful period around that time as well. So what was it like being involved? I'm an Everton fan, so I always really enjoyed right, okay. the, yeah. uh, the victory um, at Anfield you guys had. And you're, you're yeah. featured a lot on that documentary. I saw no, you. No, you yeah, I was, a, I was a young whippersnapper then who could run around <laughs> and jump around. I can't do it now. Um, yeah, I mean, look, I was living the dream. I mean, my first year at Arsenal, we got to, um, we got to the League Cup final and played Liverpool and we, we, we beat Liverpool. Charlie Nicholas scored two goals. Um, second year, we lost against Luton in the League Cup final. And the third year, we went to Anfield. Incredible story to go there and win 2-0. Two, two last game of the season nobody gave us any hope of doing it it was yeah you live it the dream aren't you it's just it's just incredible and um <clears throat> and then after that we were successful for a few more years and then post george we had a look with a lull bruce Root come in and then arson come on board and then again we had many years of great success but um I would like to think I stayed quite humble throughout of that, although uh, I got a bit excited at times. But you, you always remember that, especially in sport, um, the downside is always around the corner. And then, so when, when you're having all that success right at the start, like, do you, do you think you appreciated it at the time? Could you take it in, or were you, like, what, what was your, what were you thinking? I don't think you, anyone that goes through that, actually appreciate it because you're like a kid in a toy shop. And uh, you don't appreciate it until either it's taken away from you or you reflect back. I mean, I'm a lot older now and I look back at these things. I, I regard them as probably some of the best times of my life. Um, but at the time, you just live it day to day and, and keep thinking about, OK, what's next? What's next? And football is very, all sports very much like that, that you're successful one day and the following day you're planning the next success. And everything goes into it. And if you're not successful when you're when you finish the season, then you're planning. Okay, next year, how can we become successful? And it's 
it's a constant, constant drain on your energies to, to, to keep improving, to keep looking at what you can improve at, what you didn't do right, what you can do better. In the early days when I was on my own, um, obviously um, a lot of this stuff you did on your own, but now in the last 10, 15 years when the staffs have quadrupled even more, um, that you're looking after a, a, a multidisciplinary team, which in the current sport, in any elite sport, is is essential and fundamental to having a successful uh, medical team. Mm. And that, that you went through, I mean, for your one, it might be slightly different to other people that have gone through that period where you've got George Graham, who will be perceived as being like old school yeah. organisation. Then you got Wenger, who revolutionised the game and everyone says that. So maybe for you, it's more defined. But what was it like under George Graham there? Like, did were you? Was it like about planning, budgets and really investing as well? Yes, yeah, sort of. I mean, George was very much a disciplinarian. He dominated um, everything. He controlled everything, everything to do with the club. He was the manager and he was in control of. But, but he was very, very demanding. Um, but you knew where you stood with him. And again, that, that was an era where everybody played Saturday, Tuesday, Saturday or Saturday to Saturday. We weren't in Europe. It wasn't TV games. You weren't you weren't a case where you could play Friday, Saturday, Sunday, or Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, or Thursday. I mean, there's not one night of the week now where there's not a game live on TV. In those days, everyone was on. It was a level playing field for everyone, and so all the teams were doing the same things. So, I mean, you talk to some of the players, and they go on about the nutrition nowadays. What a load of nonsense the nutrition is. We used to have steak and chips or beans on toast, and it worked for us difference is everybody was doing that so it was a level playing field um whereas now you're looking for that one percent margin that the small gains that they, they talk about nowadays and everyone's looking for it so under george it was very disciplined it was very routine you had uh, you knew exactly what was happening with games we never used to go overnight for home games only go overnight when it's a long distance travel um, i often used to try drive the kit van because the kit man didn't didn't drive so I'd go down early with the kit, put the kit out. Um, and yeah, they they were, I used to do the pre-match orders. Can you imagine now a pre-match meal when you walk in now, there's a buffet style of absolutely everything you can dream of. When I first started in football, I used to take the orders on a Friday. So on a Friday morning when they come in, it was, what do you want tonight? Chicken, fish or steak? What do you want for your pre-match? Beans on toast, scrambled eggs on toast or an omelette? And then I used to stand at the door of the restaurant when they come out with the plates for the food and say, right, that's for him, that's for him, that's for him. There was none of this buffet stuff. Um, so, yeah, it was it was very defined, very disciplined and in hindsight, quite simple. Because everyone knew what they were doing, whereas now it's it's an event. When you go to an away game, it's an event. Yeah, no, no, I can imagine it does take absolutely like military precision yeah. and so on. And the, in terms of like with um, like George Graham and, and, and that side as well, did you like was it just you in the medical, uh, sorry, in the physio department then? Were you managing all of the players? Well, let me tell you all the staff. So the full time staff was George Graham, the manager, Theo Foley, assistant manager, myself, lead physio, Tony Donnelly, the kit man. That was the full time staff. Everyone else was part time. The doctors were part time. They came in two afternoons a week and covered the only covered home games. Very rarely went to away games. In those days, the home doctor covered both teams. Goalkeeping coach was Bob Wilson. He was part time. So we had four members of staff for the first team squad. And for the youth team, you had a kit man and two coaches. Didn't have a physio. I used to cover the physio. For, but on a match day, they had a part-time physio. That was the staff. Now, if you look at nowadays, some of the first teams, uh, um, well, they have two coaches, don't they? They have a players coach and a staff coach. And there was one team the other day that um, I, I, I thought there was, I counted 23 backroom staff that worked on a match day. So you can say it's changed a little bit, but it's th those changes, uh, also bring more challenges because when you're on your own with a small staff and one or two part-time doctors the decision making is quite simple because it's you discussing it when you go into a multidisciplinary team 
for the better, obviously. You've got a lot of people that specialise in different areas, whether it's sports science, whether it's nutrition, whether it's psych, whether it's sports medicine, whether it's a physio, whether it's a rehab physio, whether it's the masseur, whether it's the osteopath. Everyone's specialised in their area and their opinion is important to, to formulate a plan of what's best for the players. So, but somebody has to manage that. And that makes it more complicated. Yeah, no, so I'm sure. The challenges Oops. are completely different. I can imagine, but it must be quite intense. Like, did you, those four people then, would you be like together a lot or was it very much, you knew what you're doing, you got on with it? Um, my wife used to joke that I, I see more of them than I did than her. So, um, but no, you did. You, you were together all the time. And, but it makes lines of communication easier. The manager knew everything you were doing. The assistant manager knew everything you were doing. Now, a physio might see a player that comes off from training and it has to go through a chain of about five or six different people before it gets back to the first team coach. So communication skills are essential in today's game uh, and how it works in each club and every club is different. So, it, it, as I said, it simplified it. It made it a lot easier. Um, you were much more accountable for your decisions because it was only you and them. Whereas today, I think you get much more expertise and you get much more consensus of expertise. But then it makes the management harder because there'll be differences in opinion. Mm. Yeah, I mean, I've got, I've got to ask this because I just remember it so much as well. For that match then at Anfield, like, what was what was that like? Like, when you're going into that, what was the... Well, I mean, the build-ups the build up were very strange because, uh, as you, you probably remember, it was Hillsborough year. So we were supposed to play Liverpool, I think, the week or two weeks after the Hillsborough disaster. So that game was postponed. So it was always going to be at the end of the season. We went into the last three games of the season needing four points. We played Derby at home and we got beat 2-1. We played Wimbledon at home and drew 2-2. So that was the Wednesday before we played Liverpool nine or ten days later on the Friday because they had the FA Cup final on the Saturday. On the Wednesday night, Mickey Thomas got injured and it was doubtful whether he was going to make the Anfield match. And in fact, he did a fitness test on the Thursday. And I remember saying to George, he's fit enough to start. I'm not convinced he'll finish. And then we travelled on the Friday morning. We left Colney about half past nine, got up to Liverpool for lunch. The players go to bed. I went to the ground with a kit man, put the kit out and we played the game. And the plan from the manager was always to play with a back five, keep it nil-nil as long as we can, nick a goal, make them nervous, nick a second goal. And that was, he actually said we'd win 3 nil, not 2 nil. And that was the game plan. And so on the night, you're thinking, yeah, yeah, we've got a chance, but it's Liverpool away, they never lose. But then as the game went on, it was nil-nil, it was nil-nil, it was nil-nil, I think it was the 76th minute or 74th minute, we then nick a goal with uh, Smudger scoring. Then suddenly you're thinking, I don't know, this, this could happen now. And then, ironically, Mickey Thomas, who I said wouldn't finish the game, not only did he score the winning goal in the 92nd minute, he missed a great chance about 10 minutes before that, almost identical. And when he missed that, we thought, that's it, we're out. And then to win it like that at the end of the game, because people forget that we had the same points, the same goal difference, but we actually won the league because we scored more goals than them. So, yeah, it was it was just an incredible night. See, that is amazing because there's always that perception that Liverpool were like the big entertaining team and Arsenal were like the boring, boring Arsenal. So that's, yeah, it's interesting. I didn't know that stat. Yeah, I mean, it was quite, it was, there were, if you see some of the reruns on it, Bobby Robson was actually on the TV talking before the game. And people like that, who know their stuff are often quite profound. And he said, the interesting thing from tonight's game is Liverpool don't have to score and they can win the league. So how do they approach the game? Arsenal have to score, but they mustn't let Liverpool score. How will they approach the game? I think this will be a very cagey game and the first goal could decide which way it goes. And he couldn't have said it any better. He could not have said it any better. Yeah, no, no, that really was. Yeah, I remember they, they featured it on that documentary, haven't they? Yeah, about him right, doing yeah. that. 
Yeah. But no, no, it was really good. So then, so you've got that that period, real loads of success at, um, at Arsenal, and then George Graham leaves, and like, you've got you got that period there where like Bergkamp came in around that time as well, didn't he? Yeah, was, yeah. Brief, 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 came the manager for a year. Dennis uh, Bergkamp came in, and David Platt came in. So right here, yeah. So Platt came in under that right. He was around then. Could yeah. you already see it like shifting, like when when George Graham left then? Well. People that know Arsenal um, knew that the club had made a decision that they were going to go for youth and, and rebuild the club. And that's why George was brought in. He'd been very successful at Millwall with a very young team. He was the uh, youth team manager at QPR before that and did very well with them. And so the club had made a decision that's the way they were going to go. <clears throat> now, obviously, he brought them a lot of success. So he then leaves through unfortunate circumstances, but he then leaves. Um they then brought Bruce Rioch in, who probably was looked at as a similar kind of person, a disciplinarian, same style. Um, but it didn't really work. And then what's come to light afterwards, David Dean um, did a lot of work with the board about bringing, introducing Arsenal and trying to open up the way Arsenal played and the way Arsenal planned and the way Arsenal worked. Having David Platt, who spent a lot of time in Italy, and Dennis Bergkamp, who although was Dutch, has spent a lot of time in Italy to come on board. You already had that start of that foreign influence. And then when Arsene came on, he really took it to a new level. And I mean, people always ask, what did he bring to the table? That it's been well documented. But the thing that I would say that he brought to the table, which was the biggest change for me, he philosophy was you train to be able to play. So training is as important as playing. Whereas the culture, traditionally in football, as long as you play on a Saturday, I don't care what you do during the week. Arsene was completely different. So he made the players regard training as an essential part of the week. So suddenly tra training became a lot more serious. Um, it was a lot more planned. Um, the preparation, the nutrition, the recovery, all those things come onto the table. But the fact was that suddenly players realised the importance of training as well as playing. And that made a massive difference, especially to our older players. Because mm. he did inherit a lot of older players. I mean, what was like when Bergkamp came in then, like, because like he, you're, you had a, 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 you know, a reputation as a, you know, a, a, a culture that enjoyed going out and partying yeah. and so on there, which probably loads of clubs did there at the time. It's just Arsenal's was highly publicised. But it's like, yeah. what's like Bergkamp's reaction? Or, I mean, David Platt will know the players from England, but what's yeah. it like from Dennis's perspective? Yeah, I mean, someone like Dennis and a couple of the other foreign players that come in were, they found it funny. They found it quite interesting. But Dennis was disciplined enough to know what worked for him. And he didn't really go along with it. He, he, he did his own thing. He did his own preparation. Yes, he would go out socialising with the boys, but not to the level... Dennis once said to me, he, if he sat in a room with English footballers and there was eight bottles of wine on the table and sat in a room with foreign players and there was eight bottles of wine, the English players would not leave the table until every drop of wine had gone. The foreign players would walk up and leave glasses and bottles of wine on the table because they'd had one or two glasses and, and they, that was enough for them. But he, he understood the culture. What he did like about the culture, what it brought to the table was the team bonding. And, and that drinking culture that every club had was a big, big team bonding culture. They, 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 they worked together, they played, played hard together, and it really showed on the pitch when things were going against them. Um, so although it absolutely no chance in the current era could you have that sort of culture, from a team bonding point of view, there was a lot of strong things about it. Yeah, no, I can imagine. I can imagine that. And so when, when Wenger does come in then, he's like no one had really heard of him in the mainstream anyway. But like, were you were you nervous about your role? Everyone was, because we didn't know anything about him. We didn't know um, what he was going to bring to the table. Did he want to bring changes? Did he want to bring his own staff in? Um, but what, what one thing happened was he, he was, we was told of the appointment, but I think it was a, a couple of months before he actually started. So what he did was he'd had meetings, like conference calls like this with, with the staff and started telling us very early what his beliefs were, 
what his philosophies were. He reassured us that the club thought very highly of us all. He wasn't going to change anything. He told us from day one, the staff that he was going to bring in. He brought a nutritionist in from France and an osteopath in from France, but only on a part-time basis. None of the medical team were going to change. None of the backroom team were going to change apart from Borro, who's number two. Coach came in with him. So he changed very, very little. Um, and the way he worked was it was going to be an evolution, not a revolution. So he changed a lot of fundamental things like nutrition, staying in hotels, preparation. But everything else, it happened over a period of time and it slowly, slowly came in. He did that in the first season. Then obviously in the second season, when we were all ready for it, we, 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 we kicked on really because the second year, in his second season, he won the double. Yeah, that was yeah, an incredible achievement, wasn't it, to, to do that in, in that one. But in terms of like the from an injury perspective then, like with the, the diet that they'd gone from and to, like did you see much of a change in terms of the way the players were recovering and so on? Yeah, I mean, you saw a change quite quickly because basically they started eating properly. They started warming up properly. They stretched a lot more. The training sessions were slightly shorter, but a bit more intense. Um, the expectation of, uh, of what he wanted from the players was stated very clearly. Um, what he expected from us to support the players to do that um, was made very clear. Um, so, yeah, you did. You, you saw quite quickly that, as I said earlier on, the biggest thing for me was the players' attitude towards training. Whereas before it was, yeah, OK, it's only a training session, what you're worried about. Now it was, well, if I'm going to play on Saturday, I've got to train properly today. And they knew if they didn't do a proper week's training, they weren't going to play on the Saturday. Mm. And was that like, the, the, you got, say, Tony Adams there? Like, does, did he, like, engage with that straight away, that, those sort of legendary look, at, players? Look, as we all know, it's all about winning. And because they started winning games, I mean, people forget in 97, when the, we won the double in 98, I think it was Blackburn at Highbury just before Christmas. We got beat 3-1 and were booed off the pitch. Um, and it was a very nervy time for everyone because obviously Arsenal coming in first full season, it wasn't really clicking. We went in on something like a 30-game unbeaten run from there and ended up doing the double. And then I would say the week of the Blackburn game, doubts were creeping in about, is this right what we're doing? By April... Christ, this is great. Of course we're doing the right thing. So it, it, it is about winning. The only thing I would add to that, and it's been well documented by all these players that have done books or documentaries, and they all feel that he extended their career by three or four years. People like Lee Dixon, Nigel Winterburn, Tony Adams, Steve Bold, Martin Keown, they were all coming toward the end of their career when Arsenal came on. Um, but they got another three or four years at the top, top level. And some would argue, became better players. So that's when you believe in the philosophies, when you actually see yourself the difference. Mm. Yeah, and of the players that were coming through then, the Overmars or uh, those types, like, were, there, were there any that really stood out to you, either from a, <clears throat> more from like the, the sort of physio or uh, the sports medicine perspective, that you just thought, wow, they are super impressive? Probably the ones that stand out are... Um, People like Patrick Vieira and his power, um, Thierry Henry, and he was an, just an athlete. Um, the one that a lot of people forget about that was an incredible player, but unfortunately lost his way a little bit, was Nicholas Anelka. And, and he was an athlete. Um, and I think that was the, probably the biggest change over those first five years. The players that came in were very, very powerful, very, very athletic, as well as being technically good. So what that then means is from a sports medicine point of view, the dynamics of the treatment changes because you've got a very powerful dynamic player compared to the older player that um, not used to doing the stretching, not used to doing the recovery, um, to a, a, a younger player that is very, very dynamic. So then the type of injuries you're treating change slightly. Um, the way you treat them changes because the rehab schedules will change how you deal with the rehab. You're keeping them a lot fitter while they're, they're out injured. So, yeah, it, it definitely changed the dynamics of sports medicine. 
Mm. Yeah, and, and also like you, you were looking at the new training facility. At what point did that start to be on the agenda? Well, in his early years, Arson made it clear that he thought our training ground wasn't good enough. Um, um, and ironically, we had a fire there um, and it burnt down the old training ground. And that was the catalyst for us to build our new one. Um, and then that's when Arson came in with his ideas. One thing Arson did regarding the training ground and the building of the Emirates was he was very inclusive of all the staff from the kit man through to the physio, to the doctor, um, to the nutritionist. Um, and we used to have monthly meetings, planning meetings about what they were putting into the training ground, why they were putting it there, the flow of the building, the lighting of the building, how you enter the building, how you exit the building. He was one of the first guys that had a clean and dirty entrance. So you'd have a clean entrance to go through the dressing room, clean entrance, dressing room, out the back, boot room, dirty clothes, you're on the pitch, you train, you come back in, dirty clothes come off, boots come off, you come into a cleaner area. And it was very, very planned how it flowed from the dressing room to the massage room, to the medical room, to the pool, to the gym. It, it, he was very, very strong on natural light, flow of the building and what was comfortable. Um, he, had a, he had a saying, players are like water, they would take the easiest route possible. So you've got to make it the easiest route possible. And did that all come into fruition? Because you can plan for all of these things, you can get loads of input, but by the end of it, did you were you really happy with the outcome? I was really happy with the outcome. The only thing I would say is by the time we'd built it and within two years, we were starting to outgrow it because the game in general just took off. Um, and I think if you speak to anyone now that's building anywhere, the first that you say to them, okay, what would you do different? The first thing they would all say is make it bigger. Because nine times out of ten, by the time you move into it, you've outgrown it. Uh, and that was something that hit us big with this training ground. Um, and in fact, they've had, they've had to do another development since. They've done another £25 million development. And other training grounds around the country, you're reading everywhere now about the, the, the teams having new training grounds. Because they've all outgrown their old, their existing training grounds. Yeah, yeah, the Man City one's absolutely... Oh, the village, it's like a village, isn't it? I mean, that it is, is, yeah, it is. It's an incredible place. It's a great place. Yeah. And then uh, we've not mentioned that Dave... Well, you mentioned David Dean earlier on, but like he was pivotal in the whole Premier League, so he's he's always quite a public figure as well. So how, how involved was he with, uh, like, well, with you, with the team, with obviously with the manager, he'd be close, but how involved was he? You saw him nearly every day. He, he was the conduit between the football side and the, the, the directors and the, and the board. And he would be here every day. Um, he would he would know everyone's name. He would know your families. Um, he would ask how you are, uh, and he made you feel welcome and part of the foot. We we always call it the football family, and every club's got their own football family. Um, and with England, I had exactly the same thing. But you become part of a family group. And and David Dean, there's another board member here who who's still on the board, Cam Fryer. They were people that anyone, if you talk to anyone historically that's been at Arsenal, they're the two names that they would come out with, Ken Fryer and David Dean. Mm, yeah, he always comes across really well whenever he's yeah. uh, whenever he's yeah. interviewed. And then you mentioned England there as well. So at what point did you get involved with, with the national team? Yeah, I mean, that one really came out of the blue because um, in 96, we had the Euros. And I remember watching it when I was on the holiday in America. And... Uh, throwing something at the TV when we missed a penalty. And um, I then got a phone call from my father-in-law who was back in London saying, there's somebody left you a message on your answer phone. And he said, his name's Glenn Hoddle. So I thought it was a wind up. So uh, I phoned the club secretary, Sheila, and said, Sheila, do me a favor, can you phone this number and find out what it's about? And it was, it was Glenn asking, he's the New England manager, would I, like to work with him as the physio it would be on a part-time role so i'd carry on working at arsenal and i would then work with the england team on international weeks and um um at the time bruce for was a manager and um so i said to him i'd love to but obviously you need to get permission from the club so he approached the club and then bruce pulled me in the room one day and said okay what can we do to make sure that you can work for england he said, it's the greatest honour you're ever going to have and we've got to make sure that you can do it. 
And I'll never forget that because I know he was only at Arsenal for a year and he had different publicity. But for me, he was fantastic because he allowed that for me to take the opportunity. So I, my first game was in um, September um, 1996. It was David Beckham's debut. And I'm sure people remember David's debut rather than mine. I don't know why, but they do. And uh, that was my first game. And then I was, again, very, very lucky, very fortunate to do 20 years, 12 years part-time, eight years full-time. And I think in the end, I finished up doing 234 games. So I was just very, very lucky. Wow. Do you know why Glenn Hoddle approached you for it then? Um no, I don't. And especially being ex Tottenham, I've got absolutely no idea. The only thing, the only thing I would say is Dennis's agent was a guy called Dennis Roach, and my one of my best personal friends was Bob Wilson, who I mentioned before as the Arsenal coach. Bob was actually my best man when I got married, and Bob and Glenn had the same agent, and so I know Bob and Glenn knew each other quite well. Um, but I'm not convinced it was a phone call. To Bob, do you know anyone that could be the physio? I, I don't, I really, I never asked Glenn how it came around, but I was just too, too pleased and wanted to snap his hand off before he could change his mind and not to do it. So, yeah, that was a, the start of, a, again, another episode in my life that I'll never, ever forget. Yeah, I mean, you're going in after, like, euphoria, wasn't there, after Euro 96? Mm-hmm. What was that yeah. like going into that environment? <sighs> I've already said I was like a kid in the toy shop when I started at Arsenal. I think I went back into the same toy shop again. I'm now working with England. And uh, and it, uh, it, it, it ended with us qualifying for the 98 World Cup in Rome when we drew 0-0. And uh, for me, it was another massive learning curve. It was taking my skill sets to a completely higher level. Um, obviously, working closely with the clubs, um, because, again, you're borrowing the players from the clubs. And so I was a lot more conscious that, I had a lot more responsibility to look after him, look after him well and not send him back injured, which was always the biggest problem And because I know how it felt being at Arsenal. Um, but again, it took me to a new level. It took me to a new level of understanding, um, working and knowing how the game works at an international level, working with, again, big names, big players. Um, and again, some incredible experiences. Uh, I was just, again, very lucky. I did five World Cups four European Championships and the Olympics. And uh, yeah, I, am, I still have to pinch myself sometimes that, that I, what I did really, because it was just living the dream. Yeah, that, that definitely is. Yeah, because I just love that that whole era. It was just, that was the best yeah. time for me in football. But um, so that being quite publicised about like the, the players, maybe a little bit after what we're talking about there, that there was a bit of a divide between some of the players at the big clubs. But how did they respond to having an Arsenal like uh, physio treating them. Yeah, the players were fine. It was the managers that didn't like it. <laughs> and uh, some of them did moan about it quite a lot. Um, I, I would like to think that my medical skills and my experience um, stopped a lot of that. Um, I got on very, very well with the players, I, as I still do now if I see them. And I had a great relationship with the medical staff at the clubs. Um, one thing I learned very early is about being open and honest with all the medical staff and uh, the way we worked. And it's something that I spoke to Glenn about very early was as far as I'm concerned, it should be physio to physio, doctor to doctor, manager to manager. So if I make a physio decision, I'll speak to the physio and we'll discuss it. If the doctor needs to make a decision, he'll speak to the club doctor and they'll discuss it. And then if it needs to be decided upstairs, it'll go to the two managers and they need to talk, which wasn't always the case. But we tried to make it work, and I'll say a majority of the time it did work, but you're never going to ever get rid of that club versus country argument, ever. Um, and it still goes on today. Mm. Yeah, and what was it like? Glenn Hoddle's a character. Again, he's really in the press. He's got sort of mixed mixed reviews. Yeah, from I mean, I can only speak as I found, and, and he was one of the best managers I worked with. He was very knowledgeable. He, he had a certain way he wanted to play the game. He had he had a lot of philosophy similar to Arsene because they were at Monaco together. So the way he worked, I was actually quite familiar with with Arsene. Um, so it, it was quite interesting to see how similar they were. Um, and he, he treated me really well. Um, he worked really closely with his staff. He looked after the staff really well. 
And uh, yeah, I was really disappointed when he left, really, because that, that was a that was a, a really nice time. Plus, he was a manager that took me into England, so I'll be forever thankful to him. Yeah, yeah, that '98 team was was a great great team, wasn't it? Yeah, I mean, even on the day that we got beat on penalties, obviously David getting sent off, and then we having a goal disallowed with Sol. We had a couple of other great chances. It was fine lines, as we always find out in football, small margins. So throughout those periods, we really covered like, the early days there, but are there any ones that like were particularly, like just absolutely stood out more than others? The, of the obvious iconic ones, really. Um, the David Beckham free kick against Greece. I mean, the funny story there was that we were playing Greece at Old Trafford and Germany were playing Finland. And we had to match Germany's score. So we obviously thought we have to beat Greece. So we knew on the bench that Germany were drawing nil-nil. But the game hadn't finished. So we're chasing the game because we're getting beat 2-1. And then Beck scores the free kick. But our team, our players still think we need to score again. And in that first minute of injury time, we get the message that Finland-Germany finished nil-nil. So a 2-2 draw was good enough. And if you see the footage, there's all of us on the bench screaming, like, stop, Gary Neville was flying forward. They were pumping the ball down the middle, trying to get a goal. And we were on the touchline screaming that we didn't need to score. 2-2 was enough. And even at the final whistle, I'm not sure the players, that all the players knew that we had qualified for the World Cup. So that was, that was an iconic time. Um, Germany away 5-1 will live with me forever. Um, to beat Germany at any time is good, but to beat them on their own ground 5-1. And the, the picture for me that will always be with me is the 6,000 England fans doing the Dan Busters at the end of the game when we're standing in front of them. They're all standing there with their arms out doing the Dan Busters theme tune. Um, that was a great night. Getting our own back on Argentina in Japan when uh, Michael Owen scored the penalty. Ironically, Pochettino was the man that gave it away, which... Uh, when I went down to Southampton, he reminded me that it wasn't a penalty. And uh, and I said, I think you'll find it was a penalty. So we disagreed on that day. Um, so some other memories. South Africa was a, a great experience, um, despite when we went out. I still argue to this day, if Frank's goal counted to make it 2-2, we would have gone on to win that game. But I'm biased. Uh, and then the lows of Brazil when I had my accident and dislocated my ankle on the touchline for Brazil when we played Italy. Um, and my my England um, cycle, ironically, started in France 98 and finished in France 2016. So yeah. uh, I finished up where I started. So, uh, <laughs> but as I said, I have to keep pinching myself because I've been so lucky in all of those experiences and, and even the downs, I wouldn't swap any of them for the world because I've just been very, very fortunate. Mm. I mean, I, I've been, been an Everton fan. I remember like Rooney coming through and I remember some of the t- qualifying games. With- I remember him scoring his first goal against us at, at Goodison. Yeah, yes. oh, yeah, he yeah. Time. He came on in, in injury time. He screamed one in the top corner. Yeah, no, that's right. Yeah, that was it. it was 16, I think, then, wasn't he? Or, yeah, yeah that's right, yeah, yeah. Yeah, but like you've again, will have seen so many absolutely amazing players. Like you mentioned, the um, the Germany game, Owen getting a hat trick, and like those sort of players coming through. Like, what's it like being around these people? Are like global superstars? Obviously, there's Beckham as well. But what see what you got to remember is when you're working in that environment, at the end of the day, they're people. They've got emotions. They've got things that are wrong with them. They've got gripes. They've got good days, bad days. And you live with them and you're you're with them all the time. So you're treating them as people more than anything else. Um, It's only when you see the reaction of other people towards them that you realise what superstars they are. But to you, they're just people you know, people you work with. And they're the same with me. I mean, I bump into most of them are now TV punters and I'll bump into them every now and again. And you always end up hugging them and asking how the family is and uh, um, because you become a family, you become a football family. And every squad I've been in, every different years, I mean, I did a podcast with Ben Foster the other day, a couple of months ago, and I'd forgotten Ben was on the bench in Brazil when I broke my ankle. And he sat there chuckling away, describing what it was like for him watching me dislocate my ankle. Uh, and But 
you do you remember you know their families because you do become part of a family and uh, I think that's probably the side of football that fans don't see enough of that um, you win together you lose together you cry together you cheer together you are a family for a long period of time and uh, that's probably what one of the one things I would say that working in this environment all my life has been one of the best things ever yeah well that's it you, you, again it's normal completely normal for you and it's I do feel from everyone wants to be a professional footballer don't they who, who wouldn't want to be that but sort of wouldn't envy it a lot because they can't be open with anyone apart from like with you and a lot of yeah. the other people yeah I mean especially you do get very defensive towards him I must admit uh, and you read some of the stuff that the papers put on the tv they put out and you know it's not true and but also you can't say anything because it's it's what's going on in their lives and you've got nothing to do with it but you do get very defensive towards them because you understand what they're going through mm, yeah no no it is it's like you can't you, you'll kind of see people and for, for me it's like it's still you can't believe it but yeah you're in that environment day in day out and it's it's probably must be nice for them to have someone normal just to be normal with well, I think that's that's part of the job of the backroom teams to make their working environment normal and relaxing. If you're getting stressed, hyped up or worked up around them, that's going to um, fall onto them as well. And their working environment should be an enjoyable, relaxing environment because they're under enough pressure as it is when they go on the pitch without having it every day at training. And do you see, see like again, it's it's changed even then from '96. It was it was massive, but it's just now it's just ridiculously it's big. Business. I mean, it is it is a business, um, and the number of staff, the number of players, the demands that's put on them playing. I mean, everyone talks about players playing every three days. Nobody talks about the staff. They're they're travelling. They're away. They're 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 not running around like lunatics, but they're under the same pressure, under the same stress. And it's every three days for, and in the last two or three years, it's highlighted even more with COVID in that um, they don't get any breaks anymore. There's no summer breaks at all. People that have been to European Championships have been having two or three weeks and then they're straight back into it for 10 months. Uh, and it's never ending for them. So yeah, it is, it, it, look, can't dispute they get well paid, they get well looked after, they're iconic superstars, but, the lifestyle can be very, very difficult for them. And do you see that having an impact on them, like physically as well, like for, for them being able to have a break at some point? What's it like for them where they can? Well, I've been, an ad I've been an advocate for a winter break ever since I was with England. I mean, we did a big study in 2006 with Sven trying to get a winter break. We came up with loads of stats about injuries and I'm still an advocate of it now. I, I think in, in, in football now with the demands put on them mentally and physically, Mental health has become a big part now of public life. And, and the, the belief is, well, if they're paying, getting paid 100 grand a week, how can they get depressed? Don't care how much you get paid. It, mental health is mental health. And the pressures they're put under now constantly, they can't get away from it. And, and I'm a great believer in the breaks um, because they need it more physically and mentally. They need the breaks. Mm. Yeah, and then a couple of years ago, you uh, you set your own clinic up, and that looks very yeah. good on on social media. I've seen Thank all. The yeah, stuff. it's going really well. I was uh, uh, I I went to West Ham for a year, um, and with Slaven Bilic, but then when Pellegrini came in, we we all left the club. And so me and my cousin, who had been at Arsenal with me for many many years, thought, well, instead of working for someone else, why don't we work for ourselves? And we set the Lewin Clinic up in Hainault in Essex, um, and. Yeah, it's gone really, really well, and I expected to to be working there forever, and that and that was it. Um, um, Colin's very good on the business side of it. I'm terrible on the business side of it, so uh, he seems to lead that side of it. But it's gone well. We've in, we've employed some more physios now, and uh, the, the the clinic's going from strength to strength. Very good. And then you you were just telling me beforehand. Then you've you've been uh, sucked back into the game. So how did that? Yeah, go? I mean. We started the Lewin Clinic two years ago and I did it in, in the two or three years I left England. I, I did a couple of covers for Arsenal Women because I know all the backroom staff here. And the first one was a maternity cover. The second one was a physio had left and they wanted somebody to help out while they recruited a new one. So I came over and helped him out. 
got my football drug and then went away. And then they kept me on as a consultant to help out. Um, and then in the summer, they made the decision um, to put more investment into the women's team. They're developing the, the training ground. They're, we're about to spend a million pounds on a new development. Um, and they put a job out there that I thought that sounds quite good to me. So the uh, so I applied for it and, and was successful and I started in August. So I now do a combination of two days a week in clinic and the rest of the time with Arsenal women and uh, more in a management strategy role, um, mentoring the, 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 the medical team, um, supporting the medical team, writing the protocols out, trying to get more money out of the club for budgets and uh, trying to improve standards. But yeah, it's, it's, it's an exciting time, especially in women's football in general. Mm, and you've been involved in like the the creation of like a lot of training facilities and improving them, St George's Park or Arsenal. Yeah, yeah. I mean, originally we built London Colney, so I was on the planning group for that. Then we built the Emirates, so I was on the planning group for that. The new Wembley, and then St George's Park was was probably the biggest one I've been involved in because I was full time at the FA by then. And uh, so yeah, I've 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 got some experience in developing those sort of things. So uh, hopefully I can bring some of those experiences to the table um, in developing Arsenal Women Football Club. No, it is exciting that there's so much investment, like you, like you mentioned about the promotion that's going into the women's game and so on. Yeah. How are you finding working in that environment? Oh, it's great. I mean, it, it's, it reminds me of when I first started working in football, um, the passion that comes from the players, um, the developments that are going on, the investment that's going on, um, the, the public knowledge and the publicity the team are getting. Um, it's I would say it's probably one of the, the fastest growing sports in the country and it's showing that they're now getting the publicity they deserve and uh, yeah it's really exciting times yeah no no it's really good and then finally this is you've mentioned so many people already but like, who, are there any people that you think have had such a massive impact you mentioned Fred Street earlier on but who's been really like a, a major person that's been inspirational in the career um, obviously, Fred Street was my mentor and got me into it in the first place. Um, over the years, I've become very friendly with a lot of physios that have been in football a long time. Bay Fever, um, I've known for many, many years. Similar to myself, been in football his life, can't stop the drug. Um, Grant Downey's always been a great mentor and a close friend of mine. Dave Galley. Um, in the football family, I keep coming back to it, even on the physio side of it, you get to know people and they become lifelong friends. And a lot of people like that have been really, really helpful. Um, Ken Fry, I mentioned earlier, Arsenal, was on the board at Arsenal. Um, he's been one of the biggest influences on my career. But obviously, being the sentimental so-and-so that I am, I've got to say my wife, who's sat next to me for all these years and put up with me. Um, living living the dream of being in football and sacrificing so much. So, yeah, as I, I keep saying it and I'll keep saying it, I've been incredibly lucky, very humble to have the opportunities I've had and loved every single minute of it. Yeah, no, no, well, it genuinely does. Like, again, I've done all, all those people that you mentioned, I've, I've chatted with all of those, but I do look at your one and just think, God, just like that that period, certainly of England with the like, golden generation and all of that. and. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, best definitely. days. They were, they were the best days. Great days. No, it's amazing. Noel. still, it's great to hear how like, passionate you are. And genuinely, like I'm, I'm just could ask you another three hours worth of questions. Yeah. About this, and right. I don't stop talking. That's the problem. I talk <laughs> too much. I'm from the East End of London, and we don't shut up. <laughs> no, it's been brilliant. It's been really good. So hopefully, I'll uh, I'll catch you next time I'm down and about that area. Yeah, please um, come and see us. We'll show you the new facility. No, no, it'd be brilliant. I'd love to come and see uh, the Lewin Clinic as well. So, no. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Now, now come down and see us. It'd be great to see you. Brilliant. Now, I really appreciate that. Okay, mate. You take care, mate. Thanks, mate. Bye-bye. Bye, mate. Bye.